cracking everybody new video so um it's after midnight um i had fallen i had fallen asleep earlier and uh, for whatever reason i woke up and uh just not really falling asleep right now i got things on my mind so I decided to pull the camera out because at the end of the day, like I've told you guys from jump, making videos is so it's kind of like my therapy, you know, and so here I go. Um, this time around, it's going to be a little bit, it's going to be different. It's going to be. I guess a, a glimpse into how I became who I became. Um, this is where the seeds were planted, I guess we'll say. So when I was born, um, my mom was still very young <clears throat> i was born three months after she turned 16 right and um my mom was from l.a from from the sgv l.a county um, my dad was from santa barbara from the east side of santa barbara when i was born my mom was in still in the foster care system had been most of her life right my mom raised herself, basically, very wild. She was a gang member, didn't have any uh, parental figures to show her love or teach her how to be um, a parent. You know, there was no parental figure. You know, she was raised in the streets. She raised herself and she was just a baby when she had me. For the first three years of my life, it was just me and my mom's. I mean, I was a baby. She, um, I think she got a little place of her own. I don't really know all the details, right? But it was just me and her. And um, I think it was in Temple City. And there was a motorcycle gang that used to look out for my mom. She was just a little girl trying to raise a little boy, you know? And my guess would be it was the Mongols because I know they have a chapter in Temple City. And um, I know my mom said they, they would always stop by and make sure that, that she had something, you know, to eat and that I, I, I was okay. Um, but I don't know all the details, right? Then in 1977, um, my dad, who was a little bit older than my mom, um, but the same type of scenario, I, maybe someday I'll, I'll get into the dynamics of how my dad was raised, but just understand that my dad basically had to raise himself. My dad was a victim of um, physical abuse. He, my grandfather used to beat him a lot. Um, maybe someday I'll get into all that, but I say that to say that Neither one of my parents had a parental figure. Neither one of them had um, that, that um, AKA normal um, family love. They had a deal with a lot of trauma very early on in their lives. And it, and it affected how they were able to love or show love, right? So again, in 1977, my dad said, you know what? He got on my mom and said, you guys come over here. You know, we're, we're going to be a family. So we moved to a house on the east side of Santa Barbara. Again, that's where my dad was from, is from. And I was referred to that house as a, as a house of horrors, right? Um... It was an extremely, extremely violent home. I 
I remember my mom and dad were um, selling coke, selling weed. You know, when I when I hear, you know, or used to, you don't hear about it anymore nowadays. But back when, you know, like in the 80s and the 90s, when you would hear rappers talking about triple beams and moving weight and all that. I remember seeing my mom and dad um, weighing out their shit on a triple beam, breaking down the weed, breaking down the coke. My mom would be cutting up magazines to make the bindles. You know, if you're old school, you know what the bindles were to move the coke. You know, and um, it's strange because um, my mom and dad had decent jobs and were selling dope, selling weed, and we never had food in the house. Again, they were young, you know. Um, I think they they weren't into selling to get rich. They were into selling in order to pay for their partying. So maybe in their minds, I was a priority. But from what I saw, I wasn't, you know. And I watched my dad beat my mom on a regular basis. And both parents would beat the dog shit out of me. And I learned at a really young age, if I walk in that house, there's an ass whooping waiting for me. So I would get my bike and I would ride my bike. I'd be in the streets. I'd be at the neighbors or I'd be in the streets just riding my bike, riding my bike. And my dad would whistle. And I had to whistle back. And if he whistled again, that meant come home. If he didn't, he was just checking on me, right? But again, like I said, if I walked in that house, um, that I was going to get beat down by one of them, right? And I would stay out as long as I could. Every day I'd be in the streets. And I remember that's when certain seeds formulated in my mind, right? Um, I would see gang members, you know. Yeah, I was the east side, but I had my primos from the west side, you know, and I would be over there every weekend. But I saw gang members as, you know, you know, like a regular kids, they had um, Superman and Spider-Man, Batman. Those were their heroes. Me, it was gang members because I saw gang members had power, People feared them and respected them, right? And so from a very early age, I knew that's that's what I'm going to be, you know, because I was beaten, because I was neglected. I formulated these thoughts in my head where um, being a gang member is to have family and have love and respect and power, you know. And um, I remember I was really, really young. And I used to say I was from the west side, right? And I was living on the east side. All my little friends were like, you live over here. And, and you know, we'd get in fights and stuff. But um, it was a very cold um, way to grow up. And the things, the beliefs that I formed became the foundation of who I would become, you know. I was um, very, very popular. I was always very popular, but yet always felt like I'm on my own. And that's why I said what I said, like in that Swifty Blue video. You know, no matter how many people you got around you, at the end of the day, you're on your own. And I learned that lesson as a young kid, you know. And so at a very young age, I got into the gang banging. My mom and dad separated when I was young, about 10 years old. You know, we, we, we moved to the West side and um, the reality is that the beliefs that I had formed created an insecurity within me. And what, what did I do to um, counteract that? I wasn't okay with just being a regular guy, you know. I had to go above and beyond to prove 
to everyone else and myself that I, I wasn't an insecure kid, but only an insecure person does shit like that, trying to impress others, trying to get uh, approval from others. You know, I remember going to juvenile hall the first time, and I fucking hated it, man. But when I got out, all the homies and, the, and the, all the girls were like, damn, you know. And then it was like, okay, that's worth it, though. And next thing you know, I couldn't stay out of juvenile hall. Then I was in a group home. Then I was in camp. Then I was in YA. You know? And I was always trying to do extra. You know, I would, I would, you know, that's why, I, you know, I've, I've mentioned in the past when, when I killed the man that I killed, when I went to prison for him, I killed him because of my ego. And it went back to that little kid, that little neglected, abused, beaten kid, right? I was going to demand respect everywhere I went. No matter what. And so that night when, you know, these dudes started shit with us and that's the reality, they started the pedal. Um, my ego was offended that you don't fear me. Okay. Now you're going to pay for it. Um, and it took me a long time to realize that even though they started the pedal, and this is all on, it was all in court. They admitted to going to putting in work. So before all the haters get on that comment, they all admitted it. They took the stand and, and said they went to go retaliate for something that had happened the night before. But even though that happened, they ran from me. And I could have let that man, and I could have let us, I could have let them all go home that night. But my ego, that little insecure kid that was still inside of me, no matter how hard I thought I was, because I thought I was hard as a motherfucker. Nobody can convince me otherwise. But behind it all, there was still that little insecure kid within me. I didn't realize it at the time. I thought I had gone beyond that. Took me a long time to realize the motivations that I had, you know. <clears throat> and the reason why I'm telling this story is because, you know, when I was on my life today, there were a few youngsters, high school kids that were asking me for advice. And this is to show you, hey, you know, whatever you got going on in your head, whatever's going on in your heart, um, you ain't alone. No. You know what I mean? Um, I think that's what kept me up tonight is that. You know, at the end of the day, man, you know, we share these stories, these prison channels, we share, we share these stories so that you guys don't have to follow in our footsteps. Um, ain't nothing cool about killing somebody. Ain't nothing cool about hurting somebody, you know. And I've said it before, hurt people hurt people, you know. But it doesn't take away the hurt when you hurt somebody else. It transfers it for a second, but then you just make shit worse for yourself, you know. So, um, believe me, it doesn't, it doesn't do you any good to live a life of pain, trying to heal pain. It just, it, it's, it's counterproductive, man. But, um, this video is long enough. This video is a glimpse into, um, how I was able to justify hurting, you know, shooting, stabbing, robbing, you know. It is, obviously, there is no justification um, by societal view. But when you go through that type of trauma as a kid, you formulate your own belief system. That's what you live by. And I think that it's important for all of us to realize what we believe in. Pay attention to the beliefs that you have. What, what are the beliefs that you formed about the world and the people around you? Are they healthy beliefs? If they are, keep them. If they're not, work to change them. And I guarantee you, it'll make you happier and give you more peace. With that, I'm going to let you guys go. Stay safe. Stay smart. And tell the ones you love that you love them, right? I'm out.